structured syllabus that is internationally graded, and that is similar to the IB. Therefore, the bar that I have for the ABR exam is the same bar that I have for the IB. And this has helped me to maintain my grades, and it has also helped me to be competitive in everything that I do. Moving on, the consistency and the measure of um, personal progress that I have had coming from the ABR exam has also impacted me because all of my exams that I've taken, all of my exams that I've taken from the past year, I have covered four grades in a space of one year, and all of these exams I have achieved nothing but a merit, and therefore this has helped me with my personal progress and has also um, improved my self-esteem. Also, um, the ABRSM help, helps me with memorization. As you can see, I do not have a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> and reaction time, and also the importance of practice. Because in every exam that I have, I have to memorize all of my music sheets, and I have to react to my music in time so that I have, per I, I have a perfect um, piece. And therefore, it has helped me also even in, in the DP, because it has helped me to memorize. I take up subjects such as history and biology which need memorization. Lastly, my college applications have been made way easier because colleges are looking for well-rounded students who are not only focused in academics, but who, are, uh, who can do um, various things. And therefore, the ABRSM is one of the most required um, certificates when you're at university. And as for me, I aspire to be a doctor. But let me tell you, most universities need a grade five ABRSM certificate for you to be admitted into medicine. And this has made my life easier. I would recommend the ABRSM to any DP student. <laughs> My name is Ropa, and I'm going to talk about ABRSM. ABRSM has provided me with uh, numerous opportunities and benefits. I sing and I play the piano, and ABRSM has developed all aspects of piano playing, which include um, a foundation of music theory, sight reading skills, oral skills that challenge you to think. A ABRSM exams are a motivator, which uh, which provides uh, ABRSM exams are a motivator which helps you with concentration, progress, and uh, a positive attitude towards practice. ABRSM qualifications and passes can aid you to get into higher, ratio, higher levels and in educational institutions. Overall, I have developed a resilient and persevering attitude ever since I have joined ABRSM and that can be seen as evidence in my social studies as well. Thank you all so much. Um, we've got one more, um, but I'm not going to come up again, so I just want to say thank you to all the students, and I'm, I'm so proud of your presentations. Um, the next one is not... Uh, why the Wednesday related? It's, uh, it's a good example of uh, making learning real, um, where the students are studying in their curriculum and then linking in with the community event um, to actually bring that learning to, to life. And Catherine from grade eight is gonna tell you about that. presenting grade 8 for the summer project that we're currently doing, um, the Fair Trade Fair. So what is the Fair Trade Fair, first of all? The Fair Trade Fair is a fair that is combined with the U.S. Embassy and Expat Yard Sale with the help of the PTO, and it is where local fair trade companies come together, such as Batsinarai, Beobab, House by the Sea, Organic Africa, and they come to sell their products here at our school. And it is on Saturday, the 21st of May, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So the unit that we're currently working on, ethical, ethical Consumerism, is a combination of three classes, INS, LNL, and Design. In, in INS, we are working on what is fair trade and the principles of fair trade, while in LNL, we're looking at the persuasive techniques and languages that we're going to be using for our advertisement. And in Design, we've looked at eth ethical marketing and creating, our own, creating and marketing our own products. 
So in preparation to working with businesses, we've created our own products that have a social and or environmental benefit to them, and we've made business plans and adver advertising plans for these products. We've also learned about the difference between ethical and uneth unethical advertising, uh, advertising techniques, target marketing, tones and advertising in order for advertisement to be successful. So how does the grade A play a part in the Fair Trade Fair? So the students of my class of grade A were assigned local ethical businesses with the goal of helping them market their products. We wrote introductory letters and wrote interview questions which will help us in creating our advertisements because we'll be asking what the tone of their product is, what the mood of their product is, the target audience so we can you know, target the advertisement to a specific audience. And we've also practiced creating an advertisement with other companies that have already existed to gain more, like, to gain more um, experience in creating advertisements. We've also contacted the business via WhatsApp, Facebook, or Instagram to you know, organize interviews and to meet them in person. We've also created mood boards to help plan our advertisements well. And we will be going to business, the retail shops and factories for an interview and meeting the people in real life and seeing how they, how they function, if it's a, co um, a cooperative, a business, etc. So finally, our final goal is to create advertisements for these businesses and writing marketing pitches that will help sell the business, well, sell the products of the business on the day of the fair. And on the day of the fair, we'll be helping businesses set up their stalls and sell their products. Um, thank you to the US Embassy and the PTO for setting up um, this fantastic event, and I hope to see many of you <laughs> there on the day of the fair. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, and I knew what these students were going to talk about, but listening to them speak is just really inspiring and the confidence and how they're able to articulate about their learning and what they're taking away from. Am I starting in the right place? I'm okay. <laughs> um, and what they're taking away. So I definitely don't need to speak about them. You've heard from, from them about their personal experiences. That is the, um, the end of our student presentations. And so on that note, let's give them all another round of applause. <laughs> who came to represent other students. Mm -hmm. I hope next year we can have as many students in all our meetings to see how they are doing in their areas, in different areas. Um, I would like to let the parents know that we are having our this min uh, minutes uh, being taken by um, Melanie. She's sitting right at the back there. So apart from the recording that shall be shared um, uh, with all the parents with the link, uh, we also have these minutes in hard copies and they will be available in the library. Actually, all the, if you want to have a look at all the minutes from our previous meetings, they are available in the, in the library. So just to remind uh, parents that. And um, I can introduce our board members. Unfortunately, we have four of our members who are, who are not able to attend this meeting due to uh, various reasons. Um, so, as you can see, I'm Agnes and uh, I'm the chair. And uh, the two members who are in the room, can you kindly stand up so we can, yeah, so they can see you. Both we'll present later on. Yes. <laughs> um, so, if you go on our school website and under governance, uh, you can see all the members there and uh, the different committees that we, we, we represent. So we are seven of us and uh, Aden is an ex-official member. That means in, you know, in terms of decision making, she, she has no vote there, um, but she's um, part of our you know, our planning and everything. We consult with the <coughs> And there are going to be changes uh, for next year. Uh, number one, we are expanding our board by two members, and those members are going to be appointed by the, by the board. 
Um, so it will be an unanimous agreement uh, among the board members. And we are choosing these members according to the skills that we need uh, for the coming year. We shall let the parents know as we get uh, into the beginning of the next school year. Um, we have two members who are um, embers appointed, the US embers appointed, who are not going to continue for next year. And they, were, they are already replaced by two other members who are here in the room. And I uh, will um, uh, give them a chance to stand and just uh, greet parents. Uh, if we can have <coughs> Megan and Ren, just to say hello to the parents. I don't think Megan's here, but I'm Ryan. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Hi. 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 Okay. Hi. I'm, uh, I work at USA. I've been here about a year and a half. Thank you, Ren. Uh, so Ren is, <coughs> is joining us for the coming year. Unfortunately, Megan uh, could not make it uh, tonight uh, due to other, you know, uh, uh, meetings. But um, hopefully you'll be able to see her very soon. I mean, uh, yeah. Um, we would like to thank John and uh, Julie for their service for the past, you know, like John served the board for two years and Julie, uh, unfortunately, she had to go back uh, before she even finished year here. Uh, we thank her so much because she is, she was the, the governance chair and she did a great job in terms of, you know, revisiting our uh, board policies and our procedures and all that she did a, a great job. So I thank both of them. Uh, John was the vice um, chair. We went together really well, and I thank him for his service as well. Um, so, yeah. Okay. And then um, we have um, parent volunteers for this year uh, who helped us in different committees. We had Munyara Zinzarapenga who helped us uh, in the task force, our MOU task force, and uh, Lula Kifle in our governance committee, and uh, Tendai in our finance uh, committee. We thank them very, very much for you know standing up and coming to help. They've been quite helpful members of the of the board, um, and then you know the director. I mean, Adam is very committed to HIS, and you can see from all the things that she does for the school that her heart is uh, here at the school. And I thank her. I work closely with her, and really, I, I can see it. And thank you, Adam. And um, yeah, to the two board members uh, who are here present, thank you for all the work we are doing. I mean, like, it's not easy because we have other commitments, but we put our time and effort to make it work. Thank you so much. Um, and then I think we move on straight to our goals for the year. Right. Okay, so. Yes, so yeah. one of the three uh, board members present, that's me, I will join. I will <laughs> present, right, Agnes? Yes, you present. So I just want to say um, before I leave uh, I will, I will for talk. you to present everything right. else. I want to talk about the second goal, which is to collect and analyze data that will assist HIS in achieving eco-responsible leadership in Zimbabwe. So this goal, um, we, we end up not doing much on it, but we did the background you know, check on how our, our school is doing. And um, because we found that there was something that we needed to cover, uh, for this year, which was um, communications and community relations. So we, we, we thought we can move this to next year, but uh, it doesn't mean we didn't do anything about it because right now as a school, I think we are going green in so many ways. We have the solar going on, we have um, um, the biodigester, which is, uh, you know, I think Adam will talk about it later on. And uh, we have the garden and the co-curricular activity that happens on Wednesday. Yeah, the, yes. re the recycling team. The recycling team. So I think we are moving uh, in the right direction as a school, uh, but we felt that we needed to work harder um, as a joint goal to see how best we can communicate and how we can relate with our community more. 
Yeah, so we had to put that uh, as a task for us, as a, a, a goal as well. So thank you very much. Uh, you can yeah, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I went a bit too, too fast. I, uh, I was uh, keen uh, on, on the first bullet, on the first goal. Um, because um, I, I was part of the, the task force, and the task force indeed was uh, started last year and was focused on um, relooking at our founding documents. Um, we, we are allowed to, to follow our own uh, curriculum. Uh, we are allowed to follow our own uh, agenda, our, our, our school uh, schedule. Um, but for, for that, um, then, then our, our local uh, way of doing uh, finishes more or less. And, and of course, we, we have all the rights to be a local school, but we, we, we act in an international environment, and that, um, that sometimes creates boundaries and, and uh, limitations for us. Um, and within this task force, we, we have looked at um, what are the areas where those limitations uh, occur, um, what are the things that we are, are seeing, what are others doing, and, um, and, and maybe also how can we uh, change those or, or clarify them when, the, when they are unclear. Uh, and luckily, with, with the help of uh, Mr. Munyarazzi, um, he's, he's, he's quite knowledgeable in, in, in the legal um, atmosphere, so he, he, he knew how to guide us, and he also has very good connections. So it, it helped us in, in, in better understanding where we stand and, and, and where to go to um, in need enough for us to be, well, continue our school in the way we want to act here in, uh, in Zimbabwe and then to, uh, well, to, be, to remain present uh, here. Um, is the goal done? No, definitely not, uh, because it's, a, it's quite a challenging one and, and, and also considering the, the, the current uh, environment, um, we still need to seek further clarification maybe with, with authorities. Uh, with elections coming up, that's not really the, uh, the best period uh, for now. Um, but on the other side, we can say we made uh, significant progress, um, so we're on, on the right track. Um, and we will uh, continue uh, to do so. So that's regarding uh, the first one. The second one you just um, heard from, uh, from Agnes. Then on the next slide, there is something about um, the uh, diversity. And um, this was an, uh, about inclusion. And this was something that somebody from the governance committee uh, would present, who is unfortunately uh, not here. Um, so the biggest chunk of work has been done there, and the discussions, uh, uh, most of the discussions took place there. But it was about reviewing how, for instance, how do we see the, uh, the split in, in the quotas for uh, nationalities, and how do we want to maintain it, or should we maintain it, um, and how is the current situation. And, and as, as now, um, we, we have seen that the, the, the current boundary is it's at 30% for a nationality. Um, and we're reaching it. Um, so we really are coming to, to the limitations of it. So then the question is how should we change it or, or how can we um, work with it? And, and so far, as the, from the, the, uh, the governance committee, they, they want to keep the 30%, um, but they, they do want to allow exceptions in, in, in certain cases. And, and, and for instance, those exceptions have been discussed um, and have been in, in written down in the, um, Arne, you need to help me, what's the manual for? Procedures. Procedures manual. Um, and the board policies. In both of them, uh, they have been revised and, and, and that's the part that has been uh, discussed within um, the, the, the whole board. Um, then also the fee structure, the fee structure is, is still underway. Um, that is the part where, where also we will first look at it uh, within the finance committee um, as, as fee structure has a lot of impact on, on the finances. Um, so we first want to hash there what, what are the various options and implications before we then um, put it into a broader table and also discuss with uh, the bigger board, so also the people from the uh, governance uh, committee. So that's where we where we stand on the on the board calls. So not not fully finished, but I think we uh, we get a quite far. I see a question in the back. Sorry, I'm not missing. Um, with inclusion, what is the two one? Is inclusion or is it the same? Keep it as is. Okay. 
because with, with the 30%, you will always keep, keep a sufficient mix and, and, um, and you can keep the diversity. And, 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 and we've also spoken to other schools and, 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 and heard from them that indeed, you, 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 if, if one group uh, might, might grow too big, it, it will have an impact on, on the, the total balance and the diversity uh, within school. Um, so we, we do think that that is something uh, which we should maintain. Uh, however, uh, there, there should always, uh, not always, but there can be exceptions where you temporarily go over the 30%. Um, and that, that can uh, take place. Yeah? All right. All right, thank you. Thanks, Joris. Um, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Okay. Thank you all for your time, and uh, to those participating virtually, thanks to them for their time. So, before I talk through the report, I think it's important for everyone to know that we have copies of our financial statements here. And please do feel free, if you want to peruse the copies um, on site, to approach either myself or Gerald after this. Um, it's part of your right as, as, as uh, participants here to go through this and ask as many questions as you want. So keep that in mind. So just, just to give everyone clarity as to where we are financially, those of you who were here a year ago might remember that we appointed a new set of auditors, Grant Thornton. We have their first audit during the period from up to 31 July 2021. Uh, so that was the first full year of audit. These financial accounts are audited accounts that have been signed off by Grant Thornton. Um, this is important because having an external audit of that nature effectively validates both the numbers that we present but also the quality of the internal controls that govern our finances. Um, so Grant Thornton went through an extensive audit. Uh, in addition to producing these financial reports, they also produced a set of recommendations uh, that have, are being implemented by ourselves as a board um, and also by Arden, Gerald, and, 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 and their teams. So exhaustive process, all in the interest of improving the school's financial controls and transparency. Now, we have um, some highlights here and it's hard to read, so I'll just talk through a few high-level numbers. Uh, and, and let's call them um, key happenings in the last financial year. I think the most important happening was, you know, COVID, mm -hmm. which affected us, you know, personally, everyone in this room, but also affected the finances of the school, um, both from a, an interruption perspective in terms of our operations, um, which had financial implications on our top line, but also from a cost perspective, uh, in terms of certain costs that weren't incurred uh, or some costs that were incurred in an additional manner, primarily because of COVID happening. So it was a difficult trading period uh, because of external factors, but having said that, the school coped admirably well, um, notwithstanding the difficulties. For the period um, in, in question, the school recorded a deficit, I'll call it a technical deficit, of just over $200,000. It's a technical deficit purely because it was a timing, timing issue related to the flow of grants um, from FIESA, which is, which is uh, the, the, fee, the, the fee, fee provider. Um, and that flow of grant was, was affected again by COVID, where effectively we'd run a significant surplus um, in the year before, and we utilize part of that surplus to offset the deficit in this year. So whilst there's a, a technical deficit, you know, we actually ran the school, you know, in line with what the budget and plan had been. So it's important that everyone in this room knows that. I think the second key thing that I'll mention, uh, which is important from a financial position standpoint, is we are currently, number one, cash positive, um, you know, we have a net cash uh, balance as of the audited date of just over 
three quarters of a million dollars, um, and no debt uh, effectively underpinned in that. That's a significant improvement for some of you who perhaps remember the, the discussions in these meetings maybe four or five years ago. Um, the other thing that's important to note is that the policy is to keep a minimum of 25% of our operating budget as reserves, just as a buffer for a rainy day, and we are exceeding that 25% um, target. Um, and that's important again because, you know, we've been through COVID, um, we are in another period which has a number of, you know, uncertainties related to inflation, related to policy, um, potential policy changes, and it's important to have a buffer that protects us as a school going forward. So these are just very key highlights. Um, I'll talk just a little bit about our capex spend. We spent about $330,000 uh, in the financial year in question. A little bit less than we had done the year before, but as you can imagine, that would have been understandable in the context of a COVID year. Um, and just at a very high level, we ultimately then, you know, having done that capex and come up with the deficit, uh, as I mentioned, ended up with the, with the cash position, which we talked about before. Um, so that's what we've done for the year to July 2021. Going forward, and as you can recognize, we're now in May 2022, so we're in the middle of another year. What we've seen characterizing this financial year, you know, which isn't complete, is a few factors which, you know, this, this, this meeting should take into account. One is higher inflation, both, you know, coming in through our operating expenses, but also our capital expenses. Um, this is being pushed by global conditions. Um, you don't need me to tell you that there are a number of factors in the world that are causing costs to go up. The second thing we're seeing is a more uncertain policy environment, um, and this applies to us here in Zimbabwe, uh, perhaps a bit more specifically. Uh, and so these are two key things that as a, you know, as a finance committee, uh, we are keeping a close eye on with respect to trying to understand what the impact could be on our position financially and on our performance going forward. So I think that 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 helps just give you a sense of where we where we where we've been financially up to July 2021 and where we were as at the end of July 2021. I'll just dig into the detail uh, of how we performed very quickly in the year to July 2021, comparing it to the year to July 2020. Um, as you can imagine, you know, our revenue dropped um, dropped by by about 15 percent. Our income, sorry, not revenue, but from the private sector. Our income dropped uh, in, the, in 2021 compared to 2020, primarily because of a lower than anticipated um, enrollment, which has subsequently recovered. Um, also because, of course, with at a distance learning being implemented, we had to provide discounts um, to allow our parent community to basically effectively offset the fee expense they'd had against the, you know, against the fact that their children were not at school. So that affected our top line. From an expenditure standpoint, we similarly had a reduction in expenses. Again, part of it was deliberate um, in terms of adjusting our cost, cost parameters to the COVID environment. Uh, in installing or implementing new cost containment mechanisms simply to, again, manage cost and preserve cash. Um, and then I think, you know, also important to, to note is that being off campus actually resulted in a lot of cost savings, you know. So what you then had is a roughly 8% reduction in, in costs um, over that period. Now, the, we talked a little bit about the deficit, you know, of just over $200,000 in 2021 relative to a surplus in 2020. Again, it's important to stress that that was purely a timing issue. Um, we run the school uh, as a board on a zero budget 
reserve based budgeting basis, which means that as members of the faculty who are here will know, every single cost item every year has to be justified from the ground up um, and ultimately has to be matched with an income line. So effectively, we will always every year relook at costs and allow for costs that are in line with our projected revenue. So I think that should, you know, if I sat in your, in your shoes and thought, well, how do we manage, you know, the performance of the school going forward, I think that would give me a fair amount of comfort in terms of understanding that we don't simply roll forward costs uh, and that arriving at our budget is a rigorous and iterative process that takes up, frankly, many, many months uh, and, and lots of hard work from Arden and, and her team. So I think that helps give you a sense of, of, the, of the financial performance. And again, I do, do urge you to, to peruse the financial statements in, 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 uh, in more detail should you have any questions. Just turning to our outlook uh, on the next slide, um, both in terms of this year's budget and then the budget for the financial year starting in August. So we're well into um, 2022. What these pie charts do, and it's difficult to read, so I'll, I'll talk through them, is they give you a split of typically on, a, on an annual basis how we spend the budget. So the blue part is our staff costs, which typically are around about two thirds of our total, total budget. And then it runs as admin, maintenance, capex, student resources, tech and media, um, development and then strategic priorities uh, and, and, and other. So those are the, you know, for, for, for those who can't read, those are the colors working from, from you know, clockwise, going this way. Um, what you'll see just very quickly is there's hardly any change in the, in the split of the categories, you know, which reflects the priorities of the school. Uh, so that's, I think, point number one. I think point number two is to make on the 2021-2022 budget. We've just, you know, um, done the review for the, for the numbers as at the end of March, I think we've done April, and we are running in line with budget. So again, from an expenditure point of view, um, we had, you know, Arden and a team are effectively executing exactly as per plan. Um, and from a capital expenditure point of view, and there's more to come from that, um, again, the focus is on the highest priority items that will deliver the benefit to the school. Um, just lastly, on, on 2022, 2023, I think Eurus mentioned that we're spending a lot of time thinking about the fee structure, and that's a, let's call it a, you know, a, 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 a sort of medium term project, which will take some time over the next few months. There is a, an increase that's being implemented for 2022-2023, um, a very modest uh, increase in the base tuition fee, and then a, a higher increase in the capex levy, which, you know, where a discount may apply in certain instances. So it's important to, you know, to, 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 to keep that in mind that, that um, a lot of thought has gone into that, that you know, the, the metrics that have come up uh, in that increase, and that a lot of it back solves to what we think the school needs in the short and the medium term. Um, the last point, and I won't spend too much time on it because CapEx is coming up as a discussion, is there is a some significant amount of work going into the prioritization of where capital is spent um, by, by the school um, in terms of expenditure going forward simply because we are very focused on preserving resources and making sure that we're prepared for any downturns. So it's important for you to know that, you know, whilst we're in a good financial position, we're not taking that for granted. We are very focused on being as careful as we can with every incremental dollar. And we are essentially wanting to achieve the best we can from a CapEx perspective whilst retaining as much cash as we can, given how uncertain life is. So I'd encourage you all to spend time reading the financial statements. 
please reach out to me if you have any questions. And thank you all. Again, like uh, what Yuri said uh, before, that uh, the member was supposed to present on the governance committee. Unfortunately, um, they had an emergency and they cannot be with us. So I'll just take you through as to what we've been up to in our um, governance committee. So um, we worked on the inclusion policy and particularly. Um, on uh, enrollment. I, I, I think we have touched this um, a little bit more, but we were looking at the 30% uh, cutoff for, um, and uh, seeing as it is like right now, our school needs more students. So how do we then increase the enrollment when we have this um, uh, cutoff? So we um, changed that to, um, we amended the policy to include a process for considering, um, you know, different, certain cases. Uh, hence, there's a, a committee that looks at uh, students uh, who wants to enroll and do a case by case um, situation where then it's brought to the board for recommendation and for approval. Um, we also worked on our board procedures and uh, we had uh, to clarify how we tackle emergencies. So like in the past, we only relied on a, a, a quorum. So what if, you know, the quorum cannot be met and there's a, an emergency? What do we do in that sort of situation? So we formed um, an executive committee which is consisted of uh, the chair, um, the chair of the governance, uh, uh, the, the board chair, the vice, um, the finance chair, and the secretary. So those make a decision in case of a, an emergency and in case that the board cannot uh, have a quorum. And in the case that they cannot uh, meet as well, the chair uh, can through the director can uh, give a recommendation and make a decision over an emergency. Um, we also looked at, um, you know, board education. Um, we, we found out that it is important for board members who are joining because uh, board members are coming, you know, with experience from, say, corporates, it's different from the school, and some board members are coming without experience at all. How then do we nurture those board members? Uh, they need some sort of training. So we focused a little bit on that and we, um, our board members received some training. Um, we also focused on team building, how we relate as a board and how we can well work together. And we also supported the um, MOU task force um, is the, um, yeah. Um, I think that's basically um, what we did. So um, last year, we the, the secretary position was um, yeah, combined with the uh, uh, vice uh, vice chair. So this year we reinstated that uh, secretary position. We now have a secretary. So the vice chair does does not need to do. Uh, the, the, the work that is done by the secretary. I, we found that it is involving and it's a lot of work for one person to be doing that. And I think that's the, you know, the normal setup of uh, a board. So we, we have that in place. We reinstated that position. And I've talked about you know, the executive committee. And that's basically what went on uh, throughout the year with the governance committee. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is there anything else that we need to add? Because the present was good. Okay, uh, other updates. So um, we have no elections this year. 
because when we uh, changed our policy to for, for board members to stay for three years, mm -hmm. it is helping us, you know, it's, it's helping us to have members stay for a long time. And those who are leaving are elected, uh, are appointed by the uh, ambassador, so we didn't need to do any uh, elections. And if there are ever, you know, openings, we um, let the community know in, at the beginning of, uh, you know, like in March, and elections are done and uh, results are shared with the AGM, but we didn't have that this year. And then, we are also planning on moving the AGM from May to, ne to November. The reason for doing that is that, uh, as you can see, when our when Tachenda was presenting, um, the financial report that he was giving is then dated to 2021. Uh, so that means the current fi financial report is 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 not available. So. I mean, it's available, but it's not being presented to you. So it's more like we're working, you know, with all the information. So we want to move that to say, um, by the end of this, around November, September, somewhere there, we hold our AGM and we have fresh um, uh, reports and uh, information. So yeah, that's basically that. Yeah, I think I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you, Agnes, and thank you to the board. Before, um, before I go on to my uh, next section, I would like to, I, you, you see these slides and you see a few bullet points. And if you've been on a board or when you're working with a team, you, don't re you, rec you recognize that those bullet points represent profound discussions that are given a huge amount of thought. And so I do, I would like to recognize the, the amount of questioning and thinking and different perspectives that we've brought to all of those meetings and um, how appreciative I am to all of the board member, members for asking really fascinating and good questions to make sure that we come to the best decisions for, for the whole school. So if you do see our board members, please tell them that you're grateful to them because um, we should be grateful to them. It's, it's not an easy, it's not just a, you know, a check, we're here, we're done. There's a lot of work and effort that goes into these, these positions. So thank you very much. Um, all right. So I get to talk a little bit about um, the goals that I had for this year. One of them was to promote community agency to support our strategic priorities. And um, our strategic priorities are relatively new. And at the same time, they're starting to really embed themselves in conversations. So it's one thing to have it posted on a website, or it's one thing to see a poster with the strategic priorities. But we're hearing a lot of conversations now where students or teachers or staff members are saying, what if? And those are really powerful words. If we're asking ourselves, what if? That we're provoking that curiosity to think, how can we improve our school? And then we have our strategic priority areas, and then members of our community are coming up with some really very cool ideas. We have a project launch team, which uh, if you attended the, the community meeting back in November, they did a presentation. They've worked quite a bit with our staff during both of our in-services to think about, to learn about what prototyping is. So our strategic priorities, as you will remember if you were at that meeting, isn't about saying, we're going to do this, implement. It's about testing and iterations and prototyping and trying things on a small scale to see, is this something that could Im improve the students' learning experiences as we go along? So our project launch team has, it's new, they're still finding their feet. Um, having said that, we expect to have about 12 different um, prototype summaries that we'll be sharing with you at the end of this year. Those will go onto our website, and then we'll also have a year and annual report card to see how we've done in all of the different areas of the strategic priorities. So you'll be able to see that on the, the website when you come back to school in, in August. It should be up earlier, but we're just finalizing the final details because it's a new format and a new template, and we want to make sure that it looks really great. But we'll be having all of the information up very, very soon. So it's quite, um, it's quite exciting, actually. 
actually. I hope that if, if you've been part of one of those undertakings, that I hope it's been um, interesting and a learning experience for you. The other one is about uh, the, our visit from, the, from CIS, MSA, and the International Baccalaureate. So these, the Council of International Schools and MSA, those are our two, they are our crediting agencies. So they come to the school, well they came, they did a virtual visit, and they then provide a report and we received that report in January. International Baccalaureate does not accredit, they evaluate. So they come in and make sure that we are implementing the International Baccalaureate correctly, and then they give us feedback on what we need to do to continually improve the school. So we have um, these reports, and as soon as we've received these, once we receive these reports, it's not just good enough to say, check, we passed, which we did, which is great. I mean, that's really important for us as a school to know that we're internationally accredited by an international organization as well as a one from the um, United States Middle, Sto State, Middle States Association. What happens next is really quite involved. And that's where, I guess, the hard work starts, but it's also where we can be creative and think very reflectively and say, well, how could we do this better? So we have a document and we look at our commendations. And of course, whenever you're looking at feedback, it's like, you get your commendations, you go, okay, that's nice, that's nice, that's nice. And then you look right away about the recommendations. So we're looking at our recommendations. During our in-service, we spent quite a bit of time with different committees looking at um, the recommendations and putting, toward, uh, putting forth an action plan and making sure that we prioritize those. It doesn't mean that we have to implement every single solitary recommendation today or tomorrow or even in the next six months. We need to prioritize so that we can do, if we're going to take action, we need to do it properly and not rush and just do it to tick a box. We want to make sure that we do it thoroughly. So um, those are the two goals that I had. Does anyone have any questions on those before I go on? Okay. If there are any, that's okay. That you, they can come up later. Um, also, because we've been in this horrendous pandemic, our lives, our entire experiences have been put, it feels like we've been on hold, been put on hold. It's like this pause button and we're, do, do you feel like that? Like you're like frozen and finally we feel, I think, we're starting to feel like we're becoming unpaused, um, unfrozen somehow. And so these are just a few highlights of some of the, um, the things that we've been able to do, getting students involved in things, getting, I don't need to read them for you, you can have them here and we'll share the slides as well, and having parents on campus, even if we're masked up, um, for us to be able to have events like this, the uh, live AGM. We've got Moana, they were practicing, they had their last rehearsal today, and I just, just before the start, I received a text message from Gail Tomlinson and said, it was an excellent rehearsal. I'm sure that bodes well for tomorrow night. So please, if you don't have, you haven't booked your tickets, there is that link that was shared out. If you don't have it, just send me an email and I can share the link with you. But um, there's still there's there's still room for both nights. Um, we resumed our sports. There were some. I'll talk about this a little bit later. About um, so four times we've had for for different sports. We had ICEA travel. Um, we're doing a lot more sports with the local teams, so we had a, a, some basketball games recently, uh, last, last weekend, and then it's coming up again next weekend. So things are starting to pick up a little bit. Um, very exciting things, uh, the dance concert in elementary school, May 20th, an event not to be missed uh, as part of the fi Fabulous Friday. Um, I do want to say a few words, I'm just going to grab a couple of notes here, about... Um, our scholarships. This year has been actually quite fantastic in terms of uh, scholarships for our students. So I have a few few numbers for you that were shared with me. So we have a class of 19 students. Over half of them have received offers from the, uh, I guess not only scholarships, also the graduates, have received offers from universities from three or more institutes. So that's, I mean, that's really great. One of them has received seven. Yeah, 
Um, the United States remains a very, very popular destination, and so we've had uh, 85 applications to state, uh, universities in the United States, 13 in the UK, and seven in Canada. That's at this point. I mean, there are still things that are happening kind of late, but at this point, that's where we are. Some students are now applying to Australia and New Zealand, which is quite interesting, as well as Hong Kong and also um, Turkey. So we're, we're broadening that that spectrum of where students want to go, as well as um, a couple of universities in Europe. Um, we have, so we are having this interesting discussion. Last week, last weekend, I was, I, ha I had the pleasure of going to meet with the ASA heads. And so there were about 27 of us, and we were having this discussion about universities and getting into universities. And we talked about the language was pointy students. And when we talk about pointy students, we're thinking about the universities sometimes have this language about, oh, you're part of the 800 club, which is like 800, you get on the SATs, you get top scores. And that actually universities are not looking for those students who have straight, you know, for us it's straight sevens or the straight, you know, top scores in whatever program you're in. They're looking for these students, of course they want good grades. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not that they're saying, okay, you can fail all of your courses. But they're looking for these students who are doing fantastic things outside of their courses. And this makes them kind of stick up as opposed to, the, to these, yeah, the 800 club. Um, and the, our students this year have, they are, I think they're representative of pointy students. That sounds really weird. But they, they really are with their, their um, their contributions in, in art and in sports and in design and co I mean coding, all of these different things have made them very, very attractive to universities around the world. And we have eight students who have received scholarships. So that's over 40% of our, this group of students have received um, scholarships. And HALT in particular is quite impressive. They've given our students, I think it's six scholarships They've never done that. They said they've never given one single school so many scholarships. They've been so impressed with our school. So I think that's quite notable. Um, thanks very much to Carla, who has done a phenomenal job in helping the students with this process. And there are scholarships to be had. It's just going through that process. It's not a simple process. It doesn't happen just by saying, I'd like a scholarship, please. You have to do a lot of work to get it. So um, that's a quick summary on, on that. Any questions at all? Uh, last, when we had our community meeting in March, we had some students present on the coffee tender, and through the process that we worked together with the students and uh, some parents and staff, we have we came up with keeping Kenny's coffee. That might sound a little like what, why did this? Did we really need to go through this process? Actually, we did, and it was a very it was a very transparent process. Everyone contributed independently, and that's what we came up with. And they, the one caveat that they've agreed to is for them to offer healthy options for beverages. So they're working on a, on a revised menu and that should be coming out very, very soon. Okay. And HIS is having a birthday very, very soon. So we have a great team of parents and staff who have already been working behind the scenes and please look at Friday's bulletin. There will be an invitation to become part of this planning committee. But I don't want to scare anyone. It's not like join this massive undertaking because that's what this group is doing. This core group is doing a lot of work together. And it's quite significant because we want to make it something very memorable. We're looking for members who would like to join one element. So maybe you want to plan the, the dinner dance. That's, that would be the, your, your area of focus. Or maybe it would be the, the big assembly to launch it, your, our opening ceremonies assembly. That would be it. Or something, you know, there would be, a, you'll see the information in the bulletin. So you're not, if you're signing up, it's not signing up to, oh my goodness, I won't have a life. So please think about that. And I'll leave a, I'll maybe stand by the door and get a commitment before you leave this evening. <laughs> I get to take a break, Tanashi.
how we can create the space, what is needed in the space as we target sensory needs of occupational therapy children. We were looking at um, the flooring, the colors that we can use. We went all the way to discussing with um, in groups. We had emails, exchange of emails with other schools from Hong Kong, Zambia, and Lusaka. And we also had part of our team visiting St. Joe's to get an idea of what they actually have. The third stage was to ideate. In this stage, now we knew what our occupational therapy students need. We went on to discuss the type of toys that are needed, the equipment that is needed, uh, the padding, like Tinasha said, what type of space are we going to create. We went to see the place just behind the learning support classes, and now we had an idea of having spoken with our interceptors, what stimulates one child will not stimulate another child. So in inclusion, we also learned that we need to take each child differently. Some children need you know, equipment which easily stimulates, which allows them to play. And um, other students, however, have sensory needs which are sensitive. They prefer the more quieter spaces. We went on to research on equipment such as uh, forts that can be used for and putting into consideration that this space, the occupational therapy space, is for children from EC all the way up to grade 12. So we had to look at things like, we cannot make it too playful, uh, otherwise the grade 12 might feel out of place, therefore that's not creating the inclusive concept in the first instance. So we looked at different things like Maybe an older child prefers a water feature, or maybe a younger child prefers a sand pit, one prefers to climb on walls, all in the idea of inclusion. We then went on to, to build our own prototypes. This was also quite a fascinating stage. Um, that's the space behind the LSS. So I must say, if you do get a chance to look at this building now, so that when we do come back, you will find that when it's in now in place, we have turned that into a whole inclusive space, which is one of the board strategic goals. Down there, uh, to the left, we have our prototype. So in our groups, we would all discuss. We went to the place again. This time we had um, elementary students. That was really nice because they asked a lot of questions. They would ask, why would you have this here? Why won't you have it here? So in them asking, they actually opened our minds even more. We were able to respond to their needs. One would say, well, I would prefer this, this side. I think this, the side. And um, then in our groups, we all came up with different ideas. However, we all, as one, came up with that prototype, which is um, one of the students whom we're working with with that prototype. And in that prototype, that at the end, we were not sure of the colors that we're going to use. We're not sure of the equipment, the toys that are going to be used. We're also not sure of the lighting that we're going to use, which then brought us to the test. The test, uh, which was the final part, I think we did this two weeks ago. In the test with the whole inclusive idea in mind. We had a pre-mortem and post-mortem intervention, if I should use that. In this, um, we were asked what you think would go wrong. And imagine you've spent a whole 12 weeks pondering on something, and you think you've come up with this great thing, and then you're asked at the end, what could possibly go wrong? I remember sitting with Miss GS thinking, we are not quick to think negatively. But then I also learned in the process that we should also always look at if there is a possibility of something going wrong. And one of them was, what if a high school child feels out of place since it's at the LS side? So such questions helped us to realize that in as much as we're doing this, how then can we fix that 
what could go wrong. We then went through everything again to finally define how we can build a space that is inclusive in our community, which stimulates growth and sensory for occupational and physical therapy children, which then brought us to our dear architect letter. And our dear architect letter, I must tell you that it was 12 weeks, well thought, well went through, we went through every detail that you can think of. It, it was insightful, and I think we did achieve our end goal, which is how we can actually build an inclusive center. And for the name, which um, Tinashe will just reach me. Right. Um, so our OT PT space. Um, as a committee, we sat and we came up with these names. And we all then finally came up to agree with the name Bob. So with this name, um, I'll have to read on this one. It's a bit of a long one. So this this is a space which provides shelter, learning, and therapy for the community. This is a space. This space offers the ability to embrace challenges, just as the baobab that endures droughts and harsh weather conditions. The baobab na nature's personal growth as tribes who live in its vicinity grow in its strength. The mystic appeal of the baobab inspires curiosity as this space is a multifunctional campus. So as we came up, this is what is behind the name of the baobab and what we saw of what this space will become. And we're really hopeful that uh, within a few couple of weeks, um, I think within this week we will be sending out the dear architect to different architects so that we can start having proposals from architects and we can start planning. And hopefully within a few months we will be able to have completed our space. Um. Before we go on to the next slide with the next thing, I think it's also important to, because this is, this is the AGM and really this is one of the responsibilities of the, of the board. And this project was approved by the board. I mean, we don't usually announce unanimously, but I think it's okay to announce it was, a, it was approved unanimously. But this was something that was just so important for our community. And so then for us to bring together these, this very diverse group of um, staff, so not only faculty, but teachers and non-teachers, and students and parents to come through this process that we just described by Tenda, I think very much, um, has brought us to a really great point. And uh, we are sending out the Dear Architect letter, which is a little bit different from a traditional approach. We're doing that tomorrow, so that will be in the bulletin as well. So if you know any architects, please pass it on. You ready? Yep. Give me the drum roll. <laughs> And finally, um, just last week, yes, that's when this was approved. We will be having a new project, which will be the cafeteria. Uh, the design process that uh, Tendai took you through, that we went through, uh, would be starting in September, and an invitation will be sent for core and interceptors. This will be, a, we want to design a new cafeteria that is state of the art, hopefully, that will accommodate as many students and offer healthy options and to be a more inclusive part of the community. Thank you. And I think we should thank the board. I know this has been a topic that has definitely been on the on the um, books for for a long, long time, and uh, now we're going to undertake this really exciting process. So, if you'd like to be, in, if you'd like to learn more about the process, then please reach out to one of us, and um, you're welcome to join us on that exciting journey. Um, so, this is this is the last section of the the meeting. Before we go on, are there any questions? Yes. Um, we have a new board. Um, about two years ago, we received, uh, well, I was one of the people, and I think there were others, who asked 